As you arrived today, you found your seats were blocked with cards that named a state of mind or a destructive habitual action. Now most of these terms, the ones with the definitions, came from a book called To Love As God Loves by Roberta Bondi. The book is a conversation with the first scholars, the first Christian scholars from the first few centuries. The ancient fathers and mothers were teaching that um, about loving God, about loving our neighbors, and about acting in God's love to make a difference in our world. And so while the language and the words are not the same as our language and our words, the meaning is still excruciatingly relevant for us. So today, your worship was blocked with some category of worry. Now, not a productive worry, like when we're concerned over our health and that pushes us to go and see our doctor. Not a productive worry, like when we have a prudent unease about our finances and it helps us stick to a budget or a savings plan. But these are states of mind that can trap us in a downward spiral, right into a pit of despair, where our point of view is blocked, and our life is distorted, and our ability to love is taken away. Worry, for example, worry about what we eat, how much we eat, what we eat, can lead to states like anorexia or obesity. Worry about our safety can grow and grow and grow until we don't even want to leave our homes. Our hum as human beings, we've been given these rich imaginations, but sometimes our thoughts can turn against us. For example, when our children are late arriving home, we've got them off in a car crash somewhere. When, when, we, when we don't get that Promotion at work, we cast ourselves as destitute outcasts. When our relationships are threatened, we see ourselves as lonely, isolated souls, abandoned by all. But just as you were able to remove those signs and open the way to your seat, God's grace enables us to see a way out of that worry pit and a way back to loving. The ancient Christian teachers taught that prayer and meditation helped us stay in God's love, to stand firm in the Lord, as the Apostle Paul would say. The scriptures today is Paul's response to the news that he received from the church at Philippi. Last week, we learned, we learned and we read from an earlier portion of the same letter. Paul wanted to know Christ. He wanted to feel the power of the resurrection. He wanted to serve and sacrifice like Christ. And somehow he wanted to be resurrected back into God's eternal life. And he compared this drive to know Christ and love like Christ to a marathon. And he urged us to press on towards the goal. But in today's portion that Frank read, Paul encourages followers to stand firm in the Lord, to rejoice in the Lord always, and to use prayer and meditation as the way to find that peace of God that passes all understanding. Paul wrote this letter from prison. Some scholars say that it was the Mamertine prison in Rome. The, cell, the jail cell seems to have been carved out of the rock, and you can still see the hole in the ceiling through which Paul was probably lowered. It's dark and dank and musty, and it could easily become a pit of despair. But Paul remained in Christ's hope, and instead wrote this incredible letter of joy. 
Paul's antidote to worry was to carry everything to the Lord in prayer, to let our requests be known to God. Not that God is our personal shopper, ready to grant us every wish, but God is ready to hear and to heal our deepest hurts. Gospel recording artist Amy Grant sings about the honest cries of a breaking heart are better than a hallelujah sometimes. We don't have to have our act all together before we go to God. She says, God loves the lullaby in a mother's tears in the dead of night, the drunkard's cry and the soldier's plead not to die. We don't have to bear these burdens alone. We can release them to God and lean into God's peace. Paul also counsels about thanksgiving, looking for the silver lining, recognizing the things that we are grateful for. Again, back to this week's Bible study, we've been discussing cultivating contentment. We learned that one way of finding thankfulness in a situation was to remember that it could be worse. When you're getting into your reliable sedan in the morning, and as you're about to put the keys in the ignition, and you look over at your neighbor's house, and he or she is getting into their sleek, hot convertible, just think, it could be worse. When you're trudging off to work, and you're thinking about all the politics that you have to face, all the frustrations, and as you open the door to work, mumble to yourself, it could be worse. When you come home from night, tired and hungry, and you sit down at the dinner table, that your dinner that the spouse has made, don't say it could be worse. <laughs> Maybe hold that thought, even if it's overcooked broccoli, hold that thought in your head. <coughs> Sometimes I find that logic helpful, but more often I find it's easier to reframe the situation, to find the good in it. The day I started at Delmont was Frank's last day of work. He got downsized from his job. And the news spread really quickly through the grapevine of my family and friends, so that by the time I phoned a friend for, for support, she'd already heard the news. And she says, knowing me, she was waiting for me to tell her what the silver lining was going to be. And true to form, I said, God had given us the gift of time. Now we had time this summer to visit our relatives in Canada. Now we had more time to play with our grandchildren in South Maryland. Now we had time to regroup and find God's direction. And we thanked God for a time of new beginnings. Paul also advises the Philippians to meditate on what is honorable, just, pure, pleasing and commendable, to turn our thoughts to things that are praiseworthy and to look for excellence. A few months ago, my sister-in-law, Christine, received test results that indicated she may have ovarian cancer. And she worried she'd be unable to continue to care for her daughter who has Down syndrome. And her family was being tra transferred to a new town seven hours away, and she imagined herself dying in that new town. And although yet her diagnosis wasn't certain, she began to spiral into that pit of despair and darkness, and she called me for advice. And I recommended that she find an image or a thought or a phrase that she could hang on to. For me, when I'm in that really anxious state, I hum my childhood hymn, Jesus Loves Me. And so the next day, she was out walking her dog, kind of shuffling along, and thinking about what I had told her, and also thinking about our aunt who had recently passed away, and wondering if she'd gone to heaven, and kind of just being gloomy, and and 
searching, searching for that phrase. You know, my sister-in-law told me to find that phrase. And she looked down and there was a penny. And she picked it up and she thought, huh, a penny from my aunt, a penny from heaven, pennies from heaven, maybe that's my phrase. She wasn't sure, so she kept walking her dog, maybe a bit more jauntily now, and, and she's walking along within a block, another pile of pennies. And she said, this seals it for me. This is my sign. This is my pos positive symbol for me to ha hold on to. Throughout that whole week, as she went to the other city to find her new, new house, whenever she started to stew over the impending diagnosis, she would think, pennies from heaven, and be reminded that God loved her and was with her. Remarkably, through that week, whenever things started to get re really stressful, she found a penny. When she began the trip to the new city to find that house, a penny on the, on the ground outside her car. After they made an offer on the house and then doubted whether that was the right thing to do, a penny. After a trip to the zoo that was supposed to be the highlight of the weekend for her daughter but ended in tears as they got back in the car, a penny. She said that holding on to hope this way helped her stay productive and clear-headed and in fact she did not get lost in worry and became a source of joy for others around her. Now at the end of the week they returned home and discovered that the cat had pooped in the bedroom. And she said, you know what? No pennies there. <laughs> <laughs> Further testing showed that there was no cancer. And when I called last night to ask for permission to use this story, she told me they're now settled in their new home. And even though the house was totally cleared out and totally cleaned before they moved in, on that first night when she sat on the edge of her daughter's bed, a glint caught her eye in the corner. You know what it was? A penny. A penny. <laughs> she will be able to stand firm in the Lord in her new home. Our society offers other routes to happiness. I received an email this week that told me, peace of mind for $7.99. It was an ad for pizza. I didn't have to worry what I was going to feed my family tonight for dinner. Pizza would make them happy. Steve Jobs passed away this week, but he offered us the hope of technology. Think of the Apple logo. It's an apple with a bite taken out of it. A symbol from our Bible of human fallenness turned into a symbol of promise and progress. Happiness depends on happenings, but joy depends on Christ. Paul urged us to keep on doing the things that we learned like prayer and meditation and that the God of peace would be with us. The letter is known as Paul's letter of joy. Eugene Peterson, the one who wrote the message, says, that the happiness in that letter is infectious. It, we can feel the joy as the words dance and the exclamations of delight. And we want to sing with Paul, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Saint Anthony, one of those wise ancient men, said, that our hearts are made for God and we're restless until we rest in God. And we've heard today the stories of our congregation, ways that God overcame the worry in their lives and became the source of peace. Worry and joy can't share the same space. You can do one or the other. The only thing that will help us move into joy is to begin to follow Jesus. Open your hearts to the peace of God. Today, if you are struggling with worry, if there's a concern that's too big for you to carry alone, I offer you 
a chance to pray, to kneel at our altar, to pray with the support of the congregation. We can do all things through God who strengthens us.